Okay. It's hard to find a photo of me with my mouth closed. Lips perched open, hand up in the air, making a point that I'm sure was worth it. The camera would always snap with a thought in my mouth. And when the prince would come home, looks of surprise wouldn't mask anyone's laughter, understanding that I was almost physically unable to smile, to be silent for a moment. Without losing my mind of at least some of its suitcases, I never get to travel, to collect souvenirs and perspectives, and potentially a few glares from that chemistry student cramming two carols over. What happens when I can't speak? When, for whatever extenuating circumstance, silence and I are exhaustedly handcuffed like an unhappy couple's costume on Halloween night. Ely happens. Paddling down the boundary waters, I embarked on a 22-day outward-bound expedition, canoeing, hiking, and shifting the boat clumsily with my thoughts. I had some questions from the start. A lot of questions. Like, why is the water so necessarily cold? And how much would it take to convince our trip leaders to skip the whole portaging thing? It's not like carrying the canoe on your shoulders doesn't add mental weight. I thought I was doing pretty well at restraining myself, though. I didn't have answers, and I desperately wanted them, but I vaguely understood the allure of keeping some of my thoughts to myself of allowing the next gust of wind pushing our canoe along to be our surprise, not the weather forecasters. Our first blind date with silence came on the day of solos. We're sent off for two nights and two days. We were to fend for ourselves, to reflect. Stripped of our watches, headlamps, maps, and diversions, we were to sit solitarily with our thoughts and the natural world around us. We hadn't planned, anticipated for this to happen. Sure, the idea of sleeping outside was implied, but a night without contact? Silence had never been a good context for me. Silence of the lambs, the sound of silence. On this trip, we'd scaled cliffs with so few footholds they were basically slides. Canoe through headwinds gusting in our faces, counteracting our every movement. We'd even survived two nights sleeping in a campsite generously described as a mud pit. But lying down on the moss that was to be my bed, silence seemed more like a punishment, a coerced task than a break for me. A girl who could barely sit through a movie without sharing strands of loudly whispered commentary. Catherine, do you think we can make it? I asked, hoping she would have some antidote to the anxiety in my stomach. Shh, she whispered, placing her finger atop her mouth in the same motion as I remember seeing elementary school teachers march down the hallways. But I wasn't offended. It's just that she had already started. She was a silence person and I could tell by the glimmer in her eyes and the smile of anticipation spreading across her face. Unpacking my materials, I not so secretly hoped that mid-solo I'd be immersed into the Disney world of talking inanimate objects. But staring down at my slightly damp gray sleeping bag, I sensed this night would hold only a conversation for one, unless you could count the family of chipmunks playing tag around my side. Silence hadn't followed me outside of Minnesota. Even throwing on the potter's wheel, for some, a mute task was a conversation for me. Talking to the clay, I pushed my hands gradually harder, closing in on the vision of a pot, a sculpture, or a lack thereof. The moments when I let go of the dialogue, the clay also shuts me out. In my experience, silence does not make a successful plate or a peace of mind. It would be a lie to say I didn't speak over solo. Or when we had to eat quinoa stir fry with mustard and soy sauce a couple mornings later. This was not a silent trip for me, because I am simply not a silent person. I spoke until arguably I had dictated enough for a manifesto, about the branch that fell down with my tent, the rain that pooled in a typical fashion under my sleeping bag, the bird's nest I watched from the rock perched alongside the water. Liz, do you think the wilderness is for everyone? If it rains, will we need to pull over in case of thunderstorm? Joe, do you know why the trucker's hitch needs to be tied twice here? I asked questions of other questions, and I answered them. I sought knowledge, and I was ravenous for sense, for others to talk and discuss. Sometimes you shouldn't speak. You have to know to go, Liz said to me one day. But what Liz didn't understand is that I, unlike her and the Outward Bound crew, am not a silenced person. To me, speech, it means something more. For this thing you keep chasing.